Good morning out there. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our stream worship service service uh, for the third Sunday in Lent, March the 7th, 2021. Yes, it's live. Um, well, you actually have a, a few seconds delay from when this actually happens. And uh, I'm broadcasting from the office here at the Halliburton United Church. And this is the office of the Halliburton Pastoral Charge it includes Inglesby, Lachlan and Halliburton United Churches. And everybody is welcome to join in. And if you don't catch it, hopefully you know this, if you don't get it when it's happening, you can get it any time thereafter. It's recorded and sitting up there in the YouTube channel. Uh, so uh, welcome everybody. Please, it's so encouraging when people check in and, and just show up and it says 44 watching now does my heart good. So <laughs> thank you for doing that. It encourages me because, you know, uh, we need that right now. It's um, um, isolation takes its toll and we're all feeling that uh, and hopefully you know there there's uh, vaccines in the works we won't even talk about the politics of all that but you know they are happening slowly but surely and the numbers have been going down lately so uh, we're glad to hear that bunch of people checking in just gonna say hi back um, who else did we see oh, um, I've got two computers going here so I'm just gonna watch I see Paul Lynn uh, uh, ba, 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 ba. Lori Brown, morning, Lori, and uh, Jean and Warren Curry down in Hamilton. I've, I've checked in, and Lindsay Thring from Prey Staten in Wales. That's a ways away. Morning there, uh, Lindsay. I'm so glad that you continue to check in. Uh, Jane Galbraith, did I say that already? Lynn and John Ritchie, George and, and Arlene Lancaster, my cousins. Well, my wife's cousins, sort of the same thing. And Valerie Griffin out there in Gellert, and uh, Ray Selby. Morning to you all, and Eunice Pierce up in Sudbury. Uh, a good, a good, a good gang. Um, so let's kick into the announcements a little bit. Uh, we, you, we have run them, but there may be some comments to be made um, if uh, if I run them again and comment underneath. I got to not mess this up. Okay, um, a couple of things. Now I'm pretty sure that closed captioning works on this thing so I'm not sure if you know how that works but in it's it's iffy I mean it's the best guess that the YouTube automatic uh, automated translator whatever interpreter has it's pretty good at picking up what you're saying and it usually there's a button right about where is it here right about there I'd say on your on your YouTube screen that if you click it'll start up uh, and that may help if you're hearing impaired uh, you know, it, it approximates fairly strongly what is being said. So that's that's something I wanted to announce. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk a bit about four C's, the, the Christian Community Concern Center. That's a Halliburton entity, which was uh, begun, uh, I'd say, at least 40 years ago, uh, something like 40, 45 years ago, um, by the, the churches together in Halliburton as a way to... Um, to help those who are in need. And it's been, a, 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 we've been working together in with the what's called the four C's uh, for all these decades. And it's made a big difference in helping people out through some tough times. So um, we've always had a representative on that, on the board of the four C's and we'd like to keep doing that. I think the, one of the first ones was uh, Haddon Gillespie. Some of you may not remember Haddon, but he was, uh, I think he was instrumental in the startup of it. Bob Thompson, of course, was super involved. Uh, Wayne Cox has been involved, and uh, Debbie and Ron Bain have been involved. Uh, most recently, <coughs> uh, Ron Mark has uh, has been with, with us, uh, representing us there for years, and uh, he's stepping down. It's time to retire. He's living in Fenland Falls, but apparently he checks in. Um, so uh, we're looking for somebody to step in and be on the board at Four Seats. So if someone in this pastoral charge, um, Halliburton Church, wh wherever might wish to do that, might have it in their heart to do that, to represent us, that would be awesome. Uh, just get in touch with me, I'll help you through the process and tell you more if yeah, you need more information. Um, oh yeah, and we don't have a slide up for it yet, but men's isolated men's breakfast is in about two weeks, so the 20th. Uh, ben will give us more information on that in about a week. So let's, uh, let's take a look at the announcements just quickly, and I will try to go through them 
Uh, okay, we don't have ways to give. Love it when you, people continue to give. It keeps us going. The March mission is help a village effort. I showed a little film on it last week, and I will show. I think I'll show it again next week, uh, so as not to do it every week. But it's a locally based yet international, uh, uh, international helping the international uh, situations, especially in India, people that need water, uh, and it's uh, it was started by by local people. Um, you can get your announcements in your inbox if you'd like it to just be emailed to you and that tells you how we're staying closed for the time being we'll let you know more about that probably in the next few weeks um, Bible study is still going on Wednesdays 2 o'clock uh, call Lisa if you would like to get in on that that's a um, uh, women to women Bible study and on another online Zoom study, this is Tuesday evenings, 7 o'clock, and Gene Schlickland Tyler is doing that. It's a, um, using the lectionary readings, often the readings from the Sunday, that which you, you will be going, will be looking at today. Uh, and there are devotions now on our, on our websites, so uh, you, can, you can tap into the website and find those. Um, and Sunday school, virtual Sunday school is ongoing. So if you know any kids that might benefit from that, maybe they're your grandkids or your neighbor's kids, if you want to help get that going, or your kids. Um, and if you are participating in that, please send me some pictures of your kids doing their thing. Uh, what else is going on here? Oh, you, uh, Lisa's streamlined, so when you go to the, the websites for either the Pastoral Church or the Ch Halliburton Church, it, there's a button right on the front and it says, online services click there and away you go you come right to this uh, a few more people check checking in Ernest Collette Ernest Collette um, I think you're in Peterborough Christian my son Christian Jen Burke Jennifer Burke from Jen and Paul uh, Sarah Jacob my daughter uh, down in Ancaster Jan Tedford hiding in Blair Hampton can't get out John Douglas Beatty Doug Beatty uh, he's in Toronto but watching Ellen Gulp Kevin Monahan from Allen and Sharon. Uh, wow, okay. Uh, welcome, because I don't remember if you've been on there before. <laughs> um, Ernie and Linda Collette, that's right. And Sue Nicholson. Morning, everybody. So let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, what do we do? I think it's time for our prayers. Um, we've pretty much gone through the... What, what happened to the announcement... I think guess I missed that announcement on uh, time change, but time change is next Sunday morning at two o'clock in the morning. So get up at two o'clock in the morning, and switch your clock up to three o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and that way you'll you'll know what's what. We we lose an hour, but uh, you know it's going to be light much later. So that's kind of cool. So prayers, uh, prayer list, and such. Let's uh, let's spend some time in prayer. Last week um, we prayed for Greg Brown, but he actually had passed away. Before that, he was palliative. He's, a, he's not the Greg Brown from Halliburton, uh, a, a Greg Brown that lives down in uh, uh, in Lutterworth, um, Hunter Creek Estates, I guess, um, near Gary and Liz Matthews. So we pray for the family and uh, that family. And Sue Robertson has asked prayer for her grand niece nieces, Allie and Courtney, who have some struggles right now. So we're just going to pray for them. And uh, as you'll recall, I have a little response, but. You can, if you wish, participate. So I'll say, Lord, hear our prayer. And you could say, and in your love, answer. I won't know if you're saying it, but okay, let's pray. Dear Lord, our God, we are so much in need of you every second of our lives. We thank you for, for creating us and giving us life, for sustaining us by your great power and your provision. And to you belongs the glory. And we thank you so much for, for the gift of Jesus Christ that you, Jesus, Son of God, came in the flesh to earth. You uh, lived our life. You felt our pain. You, uh, you knew our sorrows and uh, our hunger. Our, uh, our, uh, you know, all the human experience was yours. You were tempted in every way, like as we are, yet without sin. And Lord, you, you suffered and died for us on a, a cruel cross. And we thank you for this great sacrifice and deliverance and love uh, displayed to all humanity. We thank you that you are risen indeed, and you are alive now, and you, you dwell in us, and in your people, and in your church. 
Lord, help us, we pray, as we continue to be separate from one another, to, to be isolated in order to prevent the spread of a virus. We pray for the end of the situation. We pray that these vaccines might be a, a, available, might be effective. And uh, Lord, we will get back to some kind of new normal. And uh, so we, we put that in your hands. We pr pray that you would heal those who, who become sick from it. Lord, that you would, pr you would uh, comfort those who have lost loved ones. And Lord, you would protect and watch over all those who are on the front lines of healthcare, of education, of uh, the marketplace. Uh, Lord, who are dealing with the public on a day-to-day -day basis, and uh, Lord, that you would you would guard them from from getting sick themselves, and uh, encourage them as they they uh, actually do something that's fairly risky. So, Lord, we put them in your hands. Uh, our EMTs, Lord, all all those in the public sector. Um, Lord, we ask for wisdom for those who are in leadership. We think of uh, Premier Ford and Prime Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, and this, to the South, President Biden and all the leaders in the states, Lord, we, uh, we pray for our local leaders that, that they might know how best to, uh, what, what good decisions to make. And uh, Lord, we put all that in your hands. Lord, hear our prayer. And Lord, we lift to you today um, Sue's grandnieces, Allie and Courtney, and the family of Greg Brown, the family of Marilyn Selby, John Romas, Ken Noble, Caroline Hunter, Maureen Duquette, Cam Brown, Kathleen Owen, Paula Bailey and her husband Dave, Chris Rusk, Derek Little. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for John Bond, Dave Kennedy, Ron and Olive Cooper, Maureen Warburton, Yolande Dehan, Don and Karen Tran, Katie Woodstra, Gladys Lamrock, Jessica Harrison, Lauren Foote. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for Chris London, Sally Moore, Darko Knezevich, Steve Wigan, Sadie Lester, Walt Griffin, and others that we remember before you in the quiet of our hearts. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love answer. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I had a note. Uh, we have been praying for Brenda Robinson, and she's uh, she is currently cancer-free. So we've taken her off the list for now, and we're happy, and congratulations to you, uh, Brenda. Um, okay, I think it's just about time to... Let's hear a little bit of music from uh, Melissa. Now, this is... It's Lenten season, so what, what we've done is uh, put together a kind of meditative uh, picture meditation of the passion of Christ. So uh, see the kind of the events leading up to his crucifixion and his death, uh, starting at the, at the Lord's Supper. So uh, uh, Melissa's playing a medley uh, bit. So it's uh, it's got the tune Jesus, name above all names, followed by there is a name I love to hear.
beautiful she can sure play those keys love it um, we're going to sing and uh, this you may or may not know we've been singing it in Halliburton it's uh, ro written by Robin Mark and Paul Beloche um, Robin Mark's an Irish uh, Christian worship song leader composer and Paul Beloche is American uh, with Canadian ties but uh, this so this is uh, it's got some got a little extra something in here today you may you may notice it it's based on uh, uh, Isaiah 53 the, the prediction of Christ you know that uh, he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities um, he, were, he was despised and he was rejected by by humans uh, and but then uh, co combined with Philippians 2 where you know his he's been given the name that is above every name at his name every knee shall bow and every tongue confess highly exalted because of what he went through our Lord Jesus Highly exalted. Yes. Uh, morning, Karen Freiborg has checked in uh, on the Lenten path to the cross. That's where we are. Exactly. So we're going to have a reading. Um, and John Menzies is reading today. He'll introduce himself. But uh, sorry about last week. Last week, there was a horrible echo. And Jane was reading. And that was on me. I accidentally forgot to, put on, to, to turn off the microphone here. So it was picking up what... I guess was coming from what she was doing, saying, and then feeding it back. So it's a bit of a feedback loop, which created an echo, and it won't happen today. So let's hear from John. From John two. Good morning. 
My name is John Menzies, and I am a member of Inglesby United Church. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the court temple, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus has spoken. May God bless this reading from his word. Thanks, John. Nobody's noting the echo today because it didn't happen. Uh, John, I think it was your aunt Joyce, I think, might be watching here from Wyerton. Um, I may not have your name right, sorry, but I hope you are. Hi out there. Uh, well read, John. Um, the uh, scripture reminded me a little bit of a song that sometimes we, we sing with the kids. So let's, people seem to enjoy the kids song thing, so let's do it again. Um, so this is, um, I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. We got a temple theme going on and a worship theme. The angels cried, holy is the Lord. We'll sing it slow once, fast once. The second verse kind of reflects the, where I'm going with my message today. So then I saw the Lord. He was standing in our midst. Uh, so not in the temple so much anymore, it's, he's, he's with us. Uh, and this, this is the Lord Jesus, who's with us even in isolation. Uh, and his glory shone around us. Sing glory, hallelujah, sing glory, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I saw the Lord, a little lower, a little loud, I think. I saw the Lord, he was high lifted up and his train filled the temple he was high and lifted up and his train filled the temple the angels cried holy the angels cried holy the angels cried holy is the Lord Lifted up, and his train filled the temple. He was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. The angels cried holy. The angels cried holy. The angels cried holy is the Lord. I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. He was standing. Midst, and his glory shone around us. He was standing in our midst, and his glory shone around us. Sing glory, hallelujah! Sing glory, hallelujah! Sing glory, hallelujah! Praise the Lord. I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. Sing glory, hallelujah, sing glory, hallelujah, 
praise the Lord. Stay. Whew. That's a workout. Um, I hope that didn't distort too much. Um, the microphone is right there, so uh, tried that. It. Let's continue to worship the Lord as we present our offering. Oh, morning, Doug. Good to see you. Hi, Ruth. We give thee but thine own, whate'er the gift may be. All that we have is thine own, a trust, O Lord, from thee. So for those of you who uh, may feel that sometimes we, we don't play the songs you know, I think a lot of the hymns we all know. But this one, I'm pretty sure everybody knows. The Old Rugged Cross. Very fitting, I thought, for, uh, for the Lenten season. Let's sing.
the old rugged cross great great oldie it's not that old by the standards of most of the hymns we sing it's a, a early 20th century uh, written by George Bernard um, but a huge favorite um, okay let's uh, let's pray Lord we, uh, we thank you for your word and all your grace which flows to us for your Holy Spirit Lord that you've given and sent into the world to uh, to draw people to, to, to Jesus Lord as we consider your word Christ and uh, we ask and seek the presence and movement of the Holy Spirit in all of our hearts and minds and lives that, that we might be drawn to you and we might uh, uh, understand a little bit more who you are and what you've called us to and what you've done for us and we ask it in your name Jesus our Lord Amen well you know our world is full of hucksters, it seems. That it's just always kind of surprising how people will try to take advantage of other people and rob them in sneaky ways and pull scams, like the callers on our telephone and sometimes emails purporting to be the CRA or our, our bank or the credit card company and that we're, they're, we're in big trouble and we better call them right now. And, of course, they're trying to get us to give them some kind of personal information or our credit card number, better still. And and get something out of us we, we get those steadily on our phones uh you know stuff like that you know i heard recently i think in the past week now with the, the covid vaccine is the thing you think wow finally the whole world's been suffering and this vaccine's coming down the pipes then i've heard that pe some people have stolen people have actually stolen shipments of the vaccine and then i heard other that other people are falsely claiming to have a uh, vaccine and they'll give you the vaccine for a price and they don't actually have it. So it's a new scam to take advantage of people's vulnerabilities and, uh, and their, their pain at this time. Just incredible. Uh, now, re religion, of course, is a great way to make a buck. And uh, people have been doing that for thousands of years. Uh, <coughs> yeah, uh, getting into a touchy subject here. But usually when, when I've talked about this, I talk about Benny Hinn, but I'm going to pick on Kenneth Copeland today. He's possibly, arguably, the most wealthiest of the televangelists. Uh, Kenneth Copeland is um, a, a strong proponent of the, uh, uh, the prosperity gospel, that, you know, everybody can be rich. And it kind of works like a pyramid scheme, I think. Somehow the money channels down to him people want to hear this message and they pay they pay uh, they, they they send and donate lots of money to the, the Copeland Ministries um, but here's just a little example of it. this is a tweet that uh, Kenneth Copeland put out a few years back uh, just give you some idea do you need a car today make the decision to take that car by faith say Thank you, Lord, for my car. Lord, I see myself in that car. Thank you, God. I believe I've received it, and I have it. I take it by faith today. That's just typical of the kinds of things that uh, are being taught as, as being part of the gospel, which, of course, they aren't. Um, and I, I found out this about it. Kenneth Copeland Ministries is located on a 1,500-acre campus near Fort Worth, Texas. The grounds include a church as well as a private airstrip and hangar for a $17.5 million jet and other aircraft. Copeland reportedly lives in a $6.3 million lakefront mansion funded by his church, although Celebrity Net Worth reports that he's worth $300 million. Other reports say Copeland could be worth $750 million or more. I know. You're saying, Morgan... Sour grapes. You just wish you were making 300 million. Well, yeah. Well, maybe not. <laughs> but not, not at the price of distorting the gospel and uh, manipulating people. Yeah, so th this is not a new scheme, something new. Uh, people have been uh, making money from religion for, for centuries. Uh, even the, the kickoff of the Reformation, uh, Martin Luther, etc., was watching. Um, so the, the Roman Catholic Church in his day was trying to raise bucks so that they could be, build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Beautiful St. Peter's Basilica. And what they decided to do was sell indulgences. And they would, you know, sell off these indulgences. Uh, indulgences were time off purgatory for your loved one. So if someone died, you figure they're in purgatory. I can get a few thousand years off if I pay some bucks. It's a great scam, a scheme, whatever. 
and it basically funded St. Peter's Basilica back in the day. And Luther said, that's wrong. You're fleecing the people and misleading them. And uh, so, you know, he was a Catholic priest and uh, he, uh, you know, he, he started protesting against such things and hence the protestant movement. But, uh, you know, that's all changed, of course. Uh, then there was a, there was a, an also a reformation within the Catholic Church, but, uh, uh, you know, th it's just this long history of people trying to make a buck. Um, and so, uh, you know, you're thinking, well, Harry, you make a buck off religion. You, you make your living off it. And I, yeah, I can't really defend myself on that count. I do do that. Um, I would say, though, that, that that's, you know, if you read Scripture, read the New Testament, there, there's, there's place for that. Paul himself talks about it. He says, he says, I have the right for it, the right to do that. And the other, some of the other apostles and, uh, uh, do do that. Um, but I, I prefer to pay my own way. So he, he actually was a tent maker and he paid his own way as he went. But he, he, he argues for the right for people to do that, especially if they're uh, doing some kind of full-time uh, preaching, pastoring, gospel ministry. Um, and a lot of times he bases this on the Old Testament teachings uh, because back in the Old Testament times, uh, the priests were, of course, funded by the, uh, by the congregation, by the, by the people of Israel, and in order to do their work. And they would, they would eat from the sacrifices that came and from the tithes that were brought. They were, they were, uh, um, th that's how they, they got their income. <coughs> now, that brings us to the subject of today. See, the priests were, were, had their income from being priests and from people's tithes, etc. But they had figured out a way in Jesus' day, uh, by Jesus' time, to make a whole lot of extra dollars. <laughs> and this is what we run into in this passage that uh, we find in John chapter 2. Um, I'm going to show you a picture of Herod's temple. So Jesus goes up to the temple for Passover. And where is it here? There's a little bit of a depiction of uh, the temple in Jesus' day. And as I think I've mentioned, I believe it was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So the temple part, the, the very high part in the center is the Holy of Holies. And outside of that is the, um, um, outside of that, and then around that is the holy place. And outside of that, the big area is, is the courtyard or the court of the Gentiles. And this actually may be off scale because I, I've read elsewhere that it was like the size of this outer court was the size of multiple five or six football fields. Uh, I'm not sure this depicts that, but it's a great, a great, this is a picture of a model that's in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. So this is a, close to what people understand that this building was like. It was torn down by the Romans in 70 AD because of an insurrection uh, by the Jews in, in that day. Um, so so the, the thing they had going on was that uh, when people came for the Passover, you were to bring offerings and tithes and, and, and animals for sacrifice, plus the, the lamb for the Passover, uh, Passover meal. Well, the problem was, say you were somebody like Jesus that came all the way from Galilee, uh, so like 180 kilometers, uh, and his, his people, that you, you, they can't take cattle and sheep and doves and all that, that distance comfortably. So... The law of Moses allowed that uh, they could they could uh, cash in their creatures uh, for money, bring the money to uh, to Jerusalem, and then <coughs> and then uh, pay for whatever uh, creatures, offerings, sheep uh, they needed to to buy for the sacrifices. So. But the problem was, in Jesus' day, they, the, the priests had decided that they only took the temple money, special money. So if you had different kind of money, you had to exchange that money, and then you had to buy the, uh, the, the cow. So they were doing all this in that courtyard. So the tables were set up for exchanging money, and also uh, you, could buy, you could buy cattle or sheep or doves uh, in, that, in that area. So the place was a big, huge marketplace. <laughs> and you can see where Jesus was, uh, and, and, the, and the priests were either directly doing the money changing, or they were, you know, they were getting a, a slice of the pie, as it were. Um, so that gives you some a little idea of the background of what's going on here. Um, there, so that that was hopefully helpful. Uh, and see that that temple was the major center central place for worship, the worship of God 
in the in the in the Jewish life, in the religious life of the, the, the Hebrew people. So uh, surrounding this place that was supposed to be holy for the Lord. Remember, I saw the Lord who was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. The angels cried, holy is the Lord. In this holy place, people were kind of crassly trying to make a buck. Uh, and Jesus was pretty put out. Now, there are some depictions of Jesus being super angry and, uh, you know, kind of throwing a temper fit and in and, 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 and an enraged manner, um, kind of whipping people and, and screaming and yelling and yeah I don't really think it was like that I prefer to think that J what Jesus did was very calculated he thought about it ahead of time and what he did was in a very calm and deliberate manner he just cleared out he just cleaned out the temple and uh, and he said what he had to say why did he do that why did he do that well there's a couple of reasons at least and uh, one was it's another sign that for those that cared to have eyes to see and ears to hear that he was the Messiah. Um, in this passage, his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Well, that's a little clue here. Zeal for your house it will consume me is was written by David, uh, the, the psalmist and the king of England, our king of England, <laughs> king of Israel, uh, around 1000 BC. So he, uh, that's when, around when he lived. Um, and so he wrote that in Psalm 69, verse 9. Uh, and, of course, the Messiah is considered to be the son of David. So things that echo David uh, are indicators that this is the Messiah. That goes along with all the other miracles and the, you know, the changing the water into wine. And uh, last week, I think it was, I talked about, you know, prophesying his, his death and resurrection in advance. So all these were, he didn't go around saying, I'm the Messiah, I am the Son of God. He he left it for people to come to that conclusion by showing them the evidence at every turn. So that's one one thing that's happening here. He's he's showing another sign that he is the Messiah. And two, basically, is it's a spiritual reason. He What he came to do was to restore proper worship to the people, to God's people, to restore proper worship, uh, healthy worship, holy worship to the people of God. Um, so and with that in mind, it's important to, to maybe note a little bit about the Passover. The Passover, as everybody, I'm sure, hopefully knows, <laughs> was the celebration of the Exodus. The, when, when the Israelites were delivered from Egypt, from being slaves in Egypt, they were delivered by a, a, the powerful hand of God. And uh, part of that was that the, the very, just before they left, the Passover meal. The, uh, the firstborn of the Egyptians were, were killed, but um, the, uh, the, the, the children of Israel were all protected. They killed the Passover lamb, they put the blood on the, on the lintels and on the, the doorposts, and uh, uh, death passed over them. And so the, they were commanded every year to celebrate and remember this, this event. And it's the central core thing of the Jewish faith to this day. Uh, the Seder, Seder, Seder is the, that Passover meal, and that's what Jesus was celebrating with his, with his disciples at the Last Supper. So, uh, you know, this, this was a huge deal for, um, for, the, for the Jews. Uh, and celebration of the Passover was commanded for all the men of Israel. And people came not only from Israel and from Galilee. They would come from Egypt and from Greece and from Turkey and from Rome. Uh, because, you know, you were supposed to. So a lot of them, of course, did do that. Um, I'm just going to read you this bit from Deuteronomy chapter 14. Uh, so if it's far away, he said, if it's far away to go, exchange your tithe for silver, take the silver with you, and go to the place the Lord your God will choose, which turns out to be Jerusalem. Use the silver to buy whatever you like, cattle, sheep, wine, or other fermented drink, or anything you wish. Then you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice. You'll eat there and rejoice. Well, I mean, that's, that's one of the key elements of worship. It's just the joy that we find in our God and in his delivering power. And uh, that was meant to be um, the experience of the Jews when they went up to Jerusalem for the Passover. Can you imagine walking as Jesus did with his family, since he was about 12 years old at least, um, 180 kilometers each way, to go up to Jerusalem to rejoice, and you get to the temple and you get fleeced by the priests. You know, so, I mean, this this was simmering in Jesus' heart for a long time. Uh, it's about joy. Uh, 
that's why he cleaned house. Called today's uh, message cleaning house. So that's why he, what he did. Now I'm going to change tune here a little bit, and that's the background of it. So after that happens, then Jesus basically redefines what a temple is. And this is pretty significant if you're going to become a New Testament scholar <laughs> and if you're going to study the, the New Testament. So uh, the, the, then the Jews demanded of him, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? They were ticked off, of course, with Jesus clearing up the temple. And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days destroy this temple. Then the Jews replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, oh, and so on. How are you going to do that? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. The temple he had spoken of was his body. Um, so Jesus is actually redefining and shifting, uh, kind of uh, reinterpreting the, the way to worship God is not going to be at a special building anymore. It's, you know, our bodies now are becoming the temples of God. So he himself uh, describes himself as the, as the temple, but uh, the early Christians picked up on this. And in the, the teaching of the apostles, uh, the early teaching of the apostles in the early church and in the New Testament was that we are the temples of God. So for instance, I said we'd jump around in the Bible a little bit. So 1 Corinthians 6, um, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, uh, he's talking about sexual immorality. Um, Whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price, the blood of Christ. Therefore, honor God with your body. So Paul clearly teaches, you know, that you, your body, is a temple of the Holy Spirit. This is now where God dwells. Um, and also collectively, Paul, Paul himself, you know, uses the, the kind of the metaphor of the, uh, um, uh, of the temple quite liberally. And in Ephesians 2, he talks about it as being the church. The church, not the church building, but the, the, the collective uh, the collective of all those who know and love Christ. And so in this, he's, he's addressing Gentiles, and he says, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens, this is verse 19 in chapter 2 of Ephesians, but fellow citizens with God's people, the Jews, and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, in Jesus, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So it's in, in the body of believers and in the body of each believer that God now dwells. So that's a huge shift. So there's a great big cosmic shift, really, uh, from the old covenant to the new covenant. Uh, we don't need a building anymore. <laughs> we don't, we can, God is not in the building, <laughs> you know. That was kind of their belief that God, God's special holy of holy places, the holy of holies was the place where God we could meet with God. But only the high priest could go in once a year. Now, in this under this new covenant, each one who uh, uh, who who gets connected with the Father and their sins forgiven and washed away and become new, a new creature, a new creation, the Holy Spirit, who is God, the Holy Spirit, lives inside us. We are temples, and uh, we are holy. Um, we don't need priests because, according to Scripture, we are we are all priests. We we connect uh, we we connect the affairs of our, our human human brothers with God, and we connect God with uh, with our human brothers and sisters. Um, and we don't need sacrifices like they had in the old covenant because Jesus has has suffered and died for us, and He's paid the price for our sins, which is kind of the core lesson of Lent. So uh, the temple was the place of sacrifice. The cross is the, where the sacrifice once for all has happened and is done. No more sacrifices need to be, um, to be made for sins, for sins and for sinners. 
Now, there, and there's, a, there's an ongoing worship sacrifice that happens, but that happens in our being. We, we present our bodies as living sacrifices to God. So if you are a Christian, if you are a follower of Jesus, your body is a temple of God. It's not built by human hands. It's built by God himself, and he dwells inside us. He dwells inside you. You are the house of God. You are the place, therefore, where worship happens. In fact, that, that's why you and I exist. We don't exist for our own purposes. We exist for God who made us. And, you know, we exist to worship God. That's, that's, our, uh, that's our purpose. We, we are at our best when we, are, when we live lives of worship. Now, does that mean we are always singing songs? No. <laughs> Although it includes that. You know, worship, the, I think nowadays there's a the kind of a, in the, the church culture, uh, sometimes worship gets equated with singing praise songs or singing hymns, which is kind of weird. It's not biblical. It, it includes that, but it's not that. Uh, it doesn't mean saying prayers, although it includes that. And it doesn't mean going to church, although it includes that too. It includes all those things, worship. But it's way more. It means living your life for God and rejoicing in his gifts continually. See that rejoicing part that they had when they were to go up to the Passover to rejoice, to worship. Uh, so living our lives for God and rejoicing in his gifts continually. And Jesus makes this possible. Through the cross, we are forgiven and we know we're loved. Uh, we're connected with God. We're reconciled to God. We rejoice in the cross. We rejoice in the resurrection. We rejoice in God's guidance and his healing ongoingly. We rejoice in the creation that surrounds us with beauty and wonder. Uh, we rejoice in family and friends, in, in the provision for our needs. We rejoice in our work, whatever that work or task might be each day that he gives us. We rejoice even in the midst of our sufferings because we know that the suffering actually works for good for us. Now, this is, this is a worship service, um, <laughs> but... It's meant to give us a boost. It's not meant to be the only place where we worship when we get together on a Sunday, either at this point, uh, virtually, or in, built, in buildings in person. It's meant to give us a boost and kind of re, a reorienting so that we worship all through the rest of the week. We are the temples of God. Jesus has cleaned us free of charge. He has cleaned our souls by his blood. And that is so that we can truly be houses of worship. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, praise you for what you have done. You have brought in a cosmic shift. <laughs> Lord, so we don't worship you necessarily in buildings. We worship you from our hearts because you have sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within us. And we are temples of the Holy Spirit. And we, as the church, are are being built into uh, a holy temple of God. Lord, we thank you that you've washed our sins away. You've cleansed, cleansed us and cleaned us and sanctified us, Lord, so that we might, uh, we might love you and rejoice in you and obey you. We thank you that uh, your grace is sufficient for us in all our circumstances. So, Lord, teach us the discipline of living lives of worship and of uh, rejoicing in all the goodness that is in you and from you, and the love that has been showered upon us through Jesus Christ, through his cross, through his resurrection. Lord, for all these things, we give you thanks and praise and worship. In Jesus' name we pray, who taught us in prayer to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Sing our closing hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross on Which the Prince of Glory Died. My richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. I think you'll know this one.
Um, I do have a couple of things to tell you just before we sign off today. I have a message from uh, Jerry Woodstra. Uh, Katie Woodstra has struggled with epilepsy and she often has seizures that they've had trouble finding help. They're flying to Vancouver today, um, to Vancouver Island, for Katie to have intensive therapy and uh, we need a miracle for her body and brain to handle the long travel. So we fly out at noon. So prayers for Katie Woodstra and her fam family as they go to BC today. And uh, um, just a reminder that the time change is next week. you got to jump ahead. You might miss us all together. I think that's how it works. Uh, a note from Eunice Pierce that uh, I think it was the old rugged cross was her mom, mom's favorite hymn. She enjoyed that today. So thanks for being with us, everybody. Uh, um, well, hopefully you'll see me next week <laughs> and we'll, we'll connect again. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit rest and remain with each one of us, both now and always. Amen.